Excellent. Well, thank you for coming along tonight. I am Paul Jose, as Todd said, and I've had a role in the School of Psychology for 22 years, so you predated me by two years only. So, <laughs> although I'm older than him, <laughs> I'd like to point out. Uh, so I've been teaching research methods in the school for 22 years, and I promise you I will not treat this like a statistics class tonight. I promise you that. Um, the goal is basically to tell you a little bit about the development of a statistical tool that Rebecca and I have um, jointly created, and we think it's cool, and we want to share it with other people. The story really tonight is about how young students come along, they absorb uh, our curriculum, even the statistical and method stuff, and they go and they run with it, and they can get a job with it. And that, that uh, does such wonderful things to my heart to, to, to see that that's possible. So I need to set the stage, and I want to talk a little bit about why statistics in psychology are important. I feel like there's maybe a slight need to convince you of that uh, fact. Um, so I'll give it a go. Statistical programs that we use are tools. All right? And they're tools like any other person would use a tool to create something. In our case, we create new knowledge. We take uh, data, we gather data, and we analyze the data with our tools to make something new from it. And we keep refining the, the tools over time so that we get better and better at what we do. So I'm giving you the example here of the microscope, the original microscope, you may not know this, the compound microscope was invented around 1590, at the beginning of the Renaissance. And the electron microscope, which was a major advance, occurred in the 20th century. And that enabled great new vistas to be opened up with this new tool. Now, I'm not promising the same thing with our tool, but it's the same sort of process that we're looking for. So I want to argue that better statistical methods help us understand human behavior better. And ultimately, what we're doing in the trenches analyzing data, evaluating interventions and, and different therapeutic techniques can hopefully lead to greater well-being, which is the goal of all of us in psychology. So we built this new tool. I'm going to call it a tool. Um, and as a teacher, when I, when I teach research methods and statistics, I fill in gaps in their knowledge. Um, but there's a bigger issue, which is about innovating in the field of statistical methods. I'll just pause for a sec, to let them come in. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm talking about is that I don't just teach. I try to innovate tools in, uh, in, in creating better statistical methods to analyze our data. So that's the vein that we're working in. And I supervise honors theses. Any given year, I'd, I'd probably do about two. And Rebecca came along, was it about two years ago? Something like that. Um, and I pitched the idea to her. So I've been working on statistical mediation and moderation. I'm going to show you a little bit about that in a minute. And I convinced her that it would be a wonderful honors project to develop a tool which would analyze curvilinear relationships. And she seemed interested, so we launched into this uh, journey together. And the idea is to create a readily accessible and easily used program that can be used to uh, quickly generate new information and depict it in graphs that you can copy and paste into documents, like, like manuscripts that you submit to a journal. Right. And that's, I think that's a good thing to do. So on this slide, I'm just talking a little bit about the psychology curriculum. What 
we ended up doing was the outgrowth of a lot of development within our school to improve and upgrade the offerings in statistics and research methodology. Now those aren't as sexy as learning about you know, developmental psychopathology, which I also do work in, or positive psychology, which I also do work in, but it, it's, it's the backbone, it's, it's, the, it's the foundation for uh, creating new knowledge. And in this journey, I have written a book and I've created an online app, application. It, this, it's called ModGraph, and this is a screenshot from the School of Psychology website where it's prominently featured. And hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people every year go to it and they use it. So what they do is they do an analysis and then put in statistical information and then it ends up graphing um, a statistical result like this. Now I'm not gonna get into the details, I, I don't think it's necessary to do that, but I just wanna say that <clears throat> I was very proud of this when I created it uh, like 12, 15 years ago and it's seen a lot of traffic uh, in terms of academic citations, I'm over 400 with that, which is pretty good. So for a, a scientific paper, if you put it out there, um, you want it to be read and cited. So people have picked this up and used it, which is cool. But it's becoming a bit dated. I'm aware of that. And I found the other day, scanning through YouTube, that there was this guy who had done a video on ModGraph. And I thought to myself, how outrageous that he stole the name of my app and he had put this video out. And I started watching it and I realized it was about my app. He never asked me. <laughs> um, so, so I, I had to change my attitude about my feelings about this guy. Uh, he did a pretty good job of, of talking about it, I, and I thought, I, well, I should have done that, but I, but I hadn't. Anyway, it's still being used out there, but it's flawed because we need something that connects the data to the process of, of generating the graphs. So it's all one piece, if you see what I'm saying. And that, and, you know, my graph doesn't do that. So I've written a book on statistical mediation and moderation. This is in the same vein of trying to improve the field, trying to bring the field along, convince the field to adopt better methods. And there's a lot in this book. Of course, I'm not going to talk about the details of it, but most of what I talk about is in the book is about linear relationships. So there's a um, an X variable predicting a Y variable, for example, in the simplest case. I did touch upon curvilinear relationships, but I reached a, a decision point with that book where I thought, yeah, I could do that. I was sitting at about 200 pages at that point, and I said, but it would double the number of pages I, have, I would have to write, so yeah, maybe not. So, Curvilinear relationships sit next to linear relationships, and they're both pretty big. Here's a, a really quick graphical depiction of a positive linear relationship, a negative linear relationship, and then occasionally, sometimes you get data where it looks like the best descriptor of the relationship between the variables is curved, and that's what we generally referred to as a curvilinear relationship. What do you do with that? Well, it's difficult. And if you look at the literature, as I have, I do it every day, I, I go looking for people who have identified curvilinear relationships and wanna, wanna study them, wanna find them again in, in new data. And what I've realized is that there's very little uptake on this issue. And it's due to these four reasons. So most researchers don't 
think in terms of these kinds of theories and predictions. So it's not the first thing they're looking for. Secondly, they may not know how to actually do the analysis. This is a few tricky things about it. Thirdly, if they get a result, how do you generate a figure? Over and over again in the literature, I see these terrible figures. People have almost literally hand-drawn them because <laughs> there's no good way to do it. And then fourthly, if you actually graph it, how do you interpret it? There's very little out there to help you understand how to make sense of this. So it's a little bit of an unknown beast for a lot of researchers. There's one exception, <clears throat> which all of you know. You may not be in psychology, but you know this law. It's called the Yerkes-Dobson law, which is that <clears throat> the level of arousal has this curvilinear relationship with the quality of your performance. So you know that as you're getting ready for some performance, whether it's musical or athletic or um, something else, you, you realize that you need to be excited and, and kind of revved up to do a good job. Okay, so you wanna, you wanna have a higher level of arousal in order to do a good job, but you realize there's a point at which it um, bites back, okay? It works against your, your intention. So you get over aroused and your performance goes down. So every, everybody talks about this. This is the Yerkes Dotson Law, dates, dates back to 1933 from memory. So it's been around almost 100 years. People know this, but yet, they don't have good me measures for capturing this kind of thing. All right, I'm gonna give you a quick example. I'm gonna wrap up and then I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca. Uh, I think the timing is working out pretty well here. I'm gonna give you a quick example and she's gonna pick it up and, and run with it. <clears throat> so I've done a lot of research on mindfulness um, which some of you actually do. So some of you may actually be meditators and you pursue this as a contemplative practice. I recommend it. It's a good way to be in the moment um, in, the, in an immediate sense, but it's also a good way for you to gain perspective about how to, how to live your life in some very important ways. So you may have to invite me back to talk about mindfulness, because I love to do that. Um, but one of the things that <coughs> researchers on mindfulness, like myself, uh, are very interested in is the inverse relationship with depression. So I have this data that was collected about almost 10 years, eight years ago? Last year of 325, it's been a while. Couple years. Yeah, and I expected to see a negative relationship between the level of mindfulness and the level of depression and self-report measures. So there was a measure of mindfulness, a measure of depression. I expected to see a negative relationship. So I ran a regression. It looks like this. The key number is right there, which you can probably not see, negative 0.61. That is a big negative number indicating an inverse relationship between mindfulness and depression. What that conceptually means is across the range of people in the sample, the higher their level of depression, the lower their level of self-reported depression. Did I say that right? The higher mindfulness, the lower their depression. <clears throat> so depressed people tend not to be mindful. Mindful people tend not to be depressed. I expect that. We see it over and over again. And I'm asking you the question here, what do most researchers do when they get a finding like that? Well, I can tell you what they do. They stop and they write it up. 
which doesn't sound like a terrible thing. <laughs> um, this is a scatter plot of that relationship. The F of MQ is the mindfulness measure. So this is higher level of mindfulness, depression on the y-axis. <clears throat> the slope of the line that you see there from upper left to, to lower right is a strong negative relationship, which is what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and when you do a regression, you have a straight line that captures the relationship. We refer, to, we refer to that as a linear relationship. I'm giving you the basics here so Rebecca can run with it. So what most people do, researchers, when they get that result, is that they would say, that's great. I'm going to write it up now. And that's what they would do. I'm one of those annoying people who come along <laughs> and say, tap you on your shoulder and go, are you sure that's the best result, you, or the most accurate result of the data? People don't like me when I do this, but I, I try to do it in a helpful way. And it turns out, as Rebecca will show you in a bit, that the best and most accurate relationship that we could draw between mindfulness and depression is actually curved. So that's technically what's known as a quadratic relationship. Okay? And I get a little wordy here, sorry about that, but what, what I'm saying, if you read what I wrote, is that it changes your interpretation of what the data are telling us when you get a curvilinear relationship like that. It, it provides additional nuance to that basic relationship. Another way to say it is that that first linear relationship, the straight line, not very accurate. And uh, we, need, we need to embrace the whole process of looking for these kind of curvilinear relationships. And I kind of stuck this in right here, but this was really, to some extent, Maybe the most important thing I want to say tonight, which is understanding the nuances of data like this have powerful implications for therapy and treatment. I, I'm not going to belabor that point, but, it, but whether you believe that's true or that's true changes how you teach mindfulness. Very strongly so. Okay, so I, I'm giving you another graph. I love graphs, sorry <laughs> if it's too much. But I, I'm superimposing the red line, which is a straight line, with the blue line, which is curved. And I want you to notice that they are most different at the upper left hand and the lower right hand corner. The distance right there is, in the world of statistics, very interesting. And there's this technique that Rebecca's going to talk about called the Johnson-Neiman test, which captures some important additional information about the nature of that curve in the graph. Essentially what it does, I think I have an example of it right here, what it does is it tells you the point at which the slope is flat in that curve. Most of the curve it's, it's got this steepness to it, which is that negative relationship. But at some point here, it becomes flat. That's interesting because it tells you that the relationship between mindfulness down here and depression here doesn't exist. That it's a null relationship right there. So people who are highly mindful, there's no relationship to their depression which is very important. Okay, so this is why, <laughs> hopefully I've convinced you, this is why curvilinear relationships are important. Um, most people miss the curvilinear relationships because they never look for them. They don't look for them because they don't have a good tool. We have a good tool, so hopefully our tool will, will fill this gap. 
So Rebecca and I created this tool. Uh, we came up with a name called CDAT. I love that name because you can see the data. <laughs> uh, okay. It actually stands for Curvilinear Data Analysis Tool, which is kind of a mouthful, but um, we're pr proud of it. And we're now going to switch people. And Rebecca's on. Reload that. Just um, get a few things lined up first. Okay, that's. And you just need to select the, the data. Okay, and this is yours. I believe yep. so. Okay, um, I'm flattered that Paul uh, described me as a young student. Um, <laughs> Younger than me, come on. <laughs> That's true. But um, uh, in my relationship with um, uh, tertiary education was sort of non-linear, <laughs> and um, uh, I um, came back uh, to study after, um, you know, a couple of decades. Um, and so my priorities and um, what I was doing were a bit different than perhaps a um, uh, undergrad straight out of um, straight out of school. So I'll just sort of, um, and, and that's kind of fed into my interest in um, uh, engaging in quite an ambitious uh, project with, with Paul. Um, and um, uh, with um, sort of uh, yeah, the, the the course that I that I took through through um, my study in psychology um, and how it links to um, career paths because uh, I think that's something that um, uh, that we're interested in talking about today. Um, so uh, in choosing. Um, how my degree was going to look and what I was going to do. I, you know, was pretty keen to maximise my employment opportunities. Um, uh, but um, I also, you know, had to take um, some interest into account. I'm interested in um, psychology and um, well-being. Um, my first, uh, my first round at university, um, I was studying, um, doing a degree in French and psychology, and um, uh, I had a terrible year. Um, uh, failed terms and everything. Um, actually, failed everything except for my psychology um, <laughs> course. And so, when I came back, I thought um, that this was probably a good place to start, um, and. Um, yeah, I really like the um, data set uh, of well-being um, measures that we uh, use to build uh, this tool because um, you know it's not uh, it's not an easy time for a lot of young people. It certainly wasn't for me. I think that um, I probably um, produced quite different data the second time round <laughs> from where I did the first time. So, um, uh, but I also. Um, had the opportunity to reconsider what I might be good at. Um, and um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we've discussed a lot is uh, that people feel a bit allergic to statistics and, and they love data. Um, we love to talk about being data driven and um, uh, making um, good decisions based on, on data and the evidence, but um, when it comes to actual statistics, the general level of um, knowledge and um, its face of interest is pretty, pretty low. Um, uh, and um, I didn't think I was interested in or good at statistics. Um, I, that was one of the papers that I failed my first time round. So I um, <clears throat> wasn't really that keen on um, facing STAT 193 again. Um, uh, but I did it, and I actually really liked it. Um, and then um, with the psychology uh, papers in second year, 
the um, research methods papers um, bringing together the um, psychology and the statistics, which I discovered I quite enjoyed, um, uh, was a bit of a revelation. So I um, took a break for a year from my psych papers and um, did statistics and um, uh, some maths papers, um, which was a bit of an ordeal. Um, <laughs> to be honest, um, and a, a couple of papers in um, computer science, so I um, did a little bit of learning to code um, as well. Um, uh, what interested me was how differently um, statisticians and psychologists um, sort of approached the same things, um, and it was a little bit confusing. Um, uh, so, uh, as Paul's um, already discussed, um, non-linear forms um, in your data aren't really something that um, that is taught in um, in the psychology uh, courses and the research method methods courses that I'd done. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, but it was something that we talked about in statistics. Um, we're taught to look for them in um, uh, diagnostic residuals plots. Um, in psychology, we very rarely looked at um, the, uh, whether our data um, sort of fitted the um, analyses that we were using. Um, Paul's mentioned a notable um, uh, example in the literature of um, um, Non-linear forms in in um, <clears throat> um, uh, in psychological data, um, but while in statistics we're taught um, to look for non-linear forms and to include them as an option when fitting models, um, uh, when it came to interpreting them, all we were told was that they're difficult to interpret. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, and, and that was the, the extent of it, pretty much. Um, so I was a bit dissatisfied with both sides of the equation and um, what I was getting all round. Um, uh, here I've got, um, uh, this is just uh, in case you wondered what I was meaning about looking at um, residuals, plots, and um, uh, diagnostics to... Um, uh, to look at whether your data fits the, um, the model that you're <clears throat> trying to describe it with. Um, and if you're a psychology student, you probably haven't looked at very many of these, um, uh, which is a pity, um, because this is, I'm not sure if this cursor will um, show up, but this is one of the ways that we might find some linear, uh, non-linear forms in our linear regression. Um, so you see there's a curved line there, um, uh, which um, looks like it could be worth exploring. Um, another thing um, that really struck me about the um, psychology um, approach to statistics is um, a, a real over-reliance on um, uh, some types of output um, sort of summaries of, um, uh, of a fit, um, like our coefficients and, and an R squared over reliance on, on the R squared um, uh, values. Uh, and um, a lack of uh, visualizing data. Um, so there's this uh, really cool um, uh, set of sort of um, fabricated data sets called the ANSCOM quartet, um, which were made in the um, 70s, um, to demonstrate exactly this, why you should always um, plot your data, uh, because um, the output for these four models uh, is basically exactly the same. Um, so if you just run an analysis and harvest your uh, results and write them up, um, there's an awful lot of stuff that's um, uh, going to be um, uh, uh, going um, unseen. Um, and um, so we've got here this nice little 
um, non-linear relationship, as well as some demonstrations of um, uh, leverage points and, and um, <laughs> extreme data points. Um, uh, so we sort of felt that there was something, I felt that there was something that kind of needed to, needed to um, change. And um, Paul um, came along with this uh, lovely um, piece of research about um, applying a um, Johnson name and technique to uh, to <coughs> curvilinear effects. It's something borrowed from moderation, um, but. Just, um, I'll give you a second to sort of absorb this. Uh, following on from what Paul was talking about with uh, linear relationships, um, uh, in a linear regression, you've got your two predictors and are multiplied together, um, and the regression solution describes a curved plane. So you can see that. This is um, a sort of 3D depiction of um, the relationship between, um, a, a, with a quadratic effect. Um, and this is pretty impossible to interpret. You can understand it falls into the difficult to interpret category. Um, and um, this is uh, a, um, <clears throat> this is the, output um, that we might see from um, the uh, from the, from a, a relationship of that kind that we've just just shown there um, so the I'm not quite sure how to move backwards back to the previous slide there the arrow up uh, so you can see the um, uh, that three d curve there translates on a 2D plane into our um, uh, curved line here of the same relationship that we all kind of keep returning to between depression and um, mindfulness. And you can see that this is a little bit easier to understand and interpret. Um, <clears throat> but it still doesn't really um, uh, address the, the point of where this relationship moves in and out of significance, um, uh, it's really easy to presume that um, output like this that has a, um, a nice p-value um, is going to be significant across the length of the relationship. Um, uh, but this is a mistake, um, especially with um, nonlinear forms. Um, and this is what the, <clears throat> the um, johnson Neyman, um approach uh, uh, addresses. Um, and we've helpfully pointed to this, uh, um, the, the point of um, uh, where it moves out of significance, which kind of makes intuitive sense because that is where the, uh, the curve becomes flat. The graph to the left shows the simple slope, which is actually calculated using um, the tangent of the, of the curve. Um, and this is the same relationship just shown in a couple of different ways there. Um, Before, before um, uh, this, uh, before this um, applying this johnson Neyman approach to um, quadratic uh, relationships, the best way that you'd be able to describe the um, slopes and the way they move in and out of significance would be um, something like this uh, simple slopes analysis um, that you see here, which just takes three arbitrary values um, of the uh, predictive variable and um, uh, produces the, um, the values of the, of the slope there, um, which is 
not very satisfying if you um, have data that skews to one side or another. You might miss the uh, important points um, where the significance actually changes. Um, so that was what we um, were hoping to address by um, creating a, a tool that would, um, that would allow us to um, perform these analyses more simply. Um, so uh, another thing um, that, uh, that's quite different in the um, approaches in psychology and statistics is the types of um, computational platforms that we use um, and in trying to uh, replicate, uh, we're trying to build a, um, an analytical tool. Um, we initially looked to create something that would work with the Jamovi um, uh, statistical platform. Um, uh, and um, uh, that was, um, Got these a little bit out of order, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, uh, that turned out to be um, a bit difficult, um, but um, we had a um, Excel um, macro uh, that was created by um, uh, Miller, Stromeyer, and Schweiderman, um, which performs these analyses. Um, a um, problem with Excel as a computational platform is that it's not very accurate and a macro like this is prone to, uh, to breaking. Um, so we decided to uh, use R and um, Shiny, um, which is a, um, uh, basically a way of creating web apps. Um, so yeah. The Jamovi module um, <laughs> required development skills that I didn't have, which is something I discovered about halfway through my honours year. Um, <laughs> um, and um, uh, realised that I needed to, um, to pivot and find a um, better, uh, better approach, or um, also known as something that I could actually do. Um, uh, and um, someone suggested to me, someone in the School of Statistics actually suggested to me that um, a Shiny would be the, the best way to do this. So um, primarily um, uh, it's, it's easy to access and easy to share. It's a web app and um, uh, you, know, you can just, um, as I'll show you in a second, click on the link and, um, uh, and it will um, you know, anyone anywhere can, can um, link into it. I can um, access the app and use it on my phone if I, if I want to do that. Um, uh, and I wanted to be able to um, bring um, diagnostics to the centre of the analysis uh, because a lot of these techniques um, are invalid if the um, assumptions of the analysis aren't met. Um, and uh, we wanted to encourage a bit of playfulness and um, exploration uh, in the data. Um, uh, a lot of the um, statistical platforms um, available are quite static, um, and um, so we wanted to be able to move uh, in between analyses and um, swap variables in and out um, to sort of really um, get get a feel for things. Now I just need to pop in here. I'm going to have to. Ah, right. Um, so I'll just give you a quick run through of the of the tool, and I think also um, Paul might like to speak to some of the relationships in the. Um, um, uh, and the data that we'll show you. Um, so once the app is um, is open, it's pretty simple to link up to a um, to a data set, and um, it's broken into a um, series of different um, analytical approaches. 
So we start off with just uh, basic um, linear regression. Um, and um, we have um, a data, um, uh, data import section here. Um, there's a tab for descriptives, um, uh, which won't show anything until I put some data in. It's probably a good idea. Um, look at this relationship between depression and mindfulness that we were already discussing. Um, we have descriptives for um, uh, um, looking at your data. Here's our uh, relationship that um, the linear relationship that Paul showed us right at the at the beginning, um, and we have some diagnostics. Um, then we move on to moderation. Um, which might look a bit more like this. Um, analysis, diagnostics. With the, um, <clears throat> I think um, uh, I should show the, um, importantly, <laughs> I'm forgetting myself here, this um, uh, it gives us the opportunity to um, move from a standard linear relationship that we see here um, to a quadratic relationship. Um, I should point out, um, as I meant to, with the um, uh, our regression analysis, as um, sort of Paul had pointed out before, we've got a um, you know the nice relationship that um, uh, an analyst is likely to um, take as a um, good thing and write up and move on. Um, but if we were to look at our diagnostics, we can see that um, curved line there in the residuals versus fitted plot. Um, and this might make you want to investigate a, a quadratic form. This is the kind of um, uh, use of the diagnostic plots and consideration of um, uh, uh, quadratic forms or polynomials um, that uh, we were taught about in our statistics classes. Um, and you can see that the diagnostic plot has changed and that uh, the kink in that line has um, straightened out. Um, and um, this is a much better fit to the data. Our regression analysis also um, looks very satisfactory. Right, absolutely. Um, that is a good call. Um, so, Just in terms of um, uh, opportunities that we have um, uh, with our, um, our tool for, for further development, um, Paul and I are still working on this. It's come quite a long way from uh, where it was at the end of last year. Um, and eventually we will be um, adding in some um, more interesting um, functionality um, uh, and some more complex and more difficult to interpret um, uh, curvilinear forms, um, uh, such as um, quadratic and linear bilinear effects, and um, quadratic and quadratic bilinear moderation, which um, 
will be, um, uh, I think. Do you think it's going to set the world on fire? <laughs> I hope so. Um, uh, okay, cool. So um, just a few things in, in closing. The um, uh, statistics is heaps more fun with better tools. Um, and um, data is um, pretty cool when you sort of get to um, exploring it and having a, a sense of fun. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, statistical tables, if anyone remembers um, looking things up in that, um, uh, wasn't a lot of fun. Um, maybe that's why I failed STAT 193 mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the first time. Um, but also, um, quantitative analysis skills are in high demand, um, so uh, it's worth kind of paying attention and um, uh, getting a handle on these. Um, uh, but without being able to interpret them, um, uh, you know, it's not of great use. Um, my project um, gave me lots to talk about um, in the in the job market. Um, I uh, was joking with my boss before I came down here that um, uh, that I would say that um, it gave me heaps to talk about in my interview, and he said. Um, I don't think you needed that to find lots to talk about. Um, <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, uh, and um, uh, ongoing projects, it's, um, yeah, it's been great to have uh, this to work on um, along with Paul. And, um, yeah, um, we're going to keep on plugging away at it. Um, thanks. I think that's...